All right, it has come to this. Today, I'm going to tell you about Noether's theorem. So, a lot of people know what the statement of Noether's theorem is. It's that for every symmetry of some physical system, you also have a conserved quantity. Um, but most people don't really, like, give you a proof of this. And when they do give you a proof, a lot of times it's this kind of, like, mystifying calculation and you're kind of wondering like wait like you know what like what really happened there um, I'm gonna give you my goal here is to give you an explanation of Noether's theorem such that by the end of it you'll really feel like mm, yeah I actually get it and I actually see why it is and actually it makes sense so it, I'll try to explain it such that if you were to actually you know be you know working with your own system and you were to see a symmetry you would actually be able to find your conserved quantity. I'm going to teach you how to do that. Um, and I think a lot of the, well, there are a few reasons why I think most explanations are like kind of bad. And one explanation is that people just aren't patient enough to explain it. Like they want to rush through the whole thing. But I'm not going to do that. I'm really going to take my time. So I'm actually going to make a few videos about Noether's theorem in a little series. But the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to develop insights um, with every video. So you don't have to watch all the videos in order to feel like you understand Noether's theorem. I'm just going to slowly build up like insights like from video to video. And I'm going to be really patient. But I think that's what you really have to do for something that's, you know, sort of profound like this theorem. Um, basically, if you can understand the principle of least action and you can understand Lagrangian mechanics, then you can understand Noether's theorem. That's all that's all I'm really going to ask. So I'm going to ask that you know, you know, about Lagrangian mechanics. But that's it. And if you don't know about the principle of least action and Lagrangian mechanics, I have some videos on those. So you should watch those first and then come back here. All right. So let me just speak very broadly for a second. Um, if you throw a ball, it'll go in a trajectory, right? It'll go in a parabola. Um, and Specifically, it goes in a parabola instead of like going in some like really funky shape, right? And what distinguishes the parabola from the really funky, you know, trajectory that you could imagine it might go in? And the difference is that the parabola satisfies the equations of motion of a ball traveling in a gravitational field. And I'm going to call equations and motions EOM. Um, so if you have a gravitational field G, with G being your gravitational acceleration 9.8 meters per second squared, um, then your equations of motion are x double dot equals 0 and y double dot equals negative G. Um, so these are your equations of motion, um, where x is your x-coordinate and y is your y-coordinate, and double dot means um, your second time derivative. So x double dot equals the second derivative of x with respect to time. All right, um, so, you know, if you have a path, x equals vt, right, where t is your time and v is just any velocity, um, and y equals negative one-half gt squared, then, you know, you could say, all right, well, let's look at that. Um, let's differentiate x with respect to time twice. So x double dot, well, that's just zero. And y double dot, well, that's negative g. So, oh, looks like it, it satisfies my equations of motion. And if you were to have some really funky thing, like, I don't know, like x equals, you know, sine of omega times t, um, that, you know, x double dot wouldn't be zero, right? So it wouldn't satisfy the equations of motion, and that's not the path that a ball would take. Solutions to the equations of motion give us physical paths. Now, there's something else I want to say. Um, when I talk about the path that things take, I don't necessarily mean the path that they take in real space. So, um, you know, say, for example, you had a pendulum with length L, 
um, in a gravitational field G. And the weight at the end of the pendulum has a coordinate x and y. And you can imagine, you know, the path that the pendulum takes in real space where x and y change, and they swing back and forth and stuff. Um, there's something else you can do, and something that people often do, is that you can just think of the angle theta that the pendulum makes with the vertical, right? And instead of thinking about the path that the pendulum takes in real space, we can think about the path that the pendulum takes in theta space. So theta will change in time, and therefore we can think about, you know, we could graph theta with time and think about, you know, however, like, theta changes. Um, and actually, I guess, if I wanted to make this accurate, it would look like that. Um, so the equation for motion, the equation of motion for theta, if you're interested, would just be theta double dot equals negative g over l times sine of theta. And in general, some when you know, and sometimes in the, throughout this video, um, or rather throughout this series of videos, I'm going to do what physicists often do, and use q sub i to be to represent the coordinates that I'm interested in. So here, i would be an integer that runs from 1 to n, where n is just however many variables I have. So if I were to just be interested in theta, well, theta would be my q sub 1. And if I were to be interested in x and y, then I would, might call x q1, and I might call y q2, and in this case, n would be equal to 2. Um, and if I had, you know, I don't know, like two particles moving, and particle 1 had coordinates x1, comma y1, and particle 2 had coordinates x2, comma y2, then here um, n would be equal to 4, because I'm interested in four different coordinates, and I might label them x1 is q1, y1 is q2, x2 is q3, and y2 is q4. All right, now we're going to talk about symmetries of the equations of motion. So, as an example, um, let's consider two planets orbiting each other according to Newtonian gravity. These two planets are going to orbit each other in ellipses, right, like this. And I'm not going to write out the equations of motion, but if we were to write out the equations of motion, you know, we could plug in these two ellipses um, for the coordinates of a particle, for our planets, rather, and we would see that they would indeed satisfy the equations of motion. So let's say we took our trajectories um, and just translated them somewhere else, right? And then we would take our translated trajectories and see if these satisfied the equations of motion. And in this case, yes, we would find that they would actually satisfy the equations of motion. So solutions to the equations of motion, when translated in space somewhere else, are just other solutions to the equations of motion. So let's consider um, another possible way we could change these trajectories. Let's say we were to rotate them. So here I'm picturing rotating those trajectories like this. So now the particles are going like this. And let's say after rotating both of our trajectories together, we were to check again whether or not they satisfied the equations of motion. What we would find is that, yes, they would still satisfy the equations of motion. And there's another symmetry here um, I like to talk about, and it's hard to draw. But let's just say we're to take all of our coordinates, um, q sub i, and these depend on time, right? So let's say we were to take the q sub i's that correspond to these trajectories, and we were to then change them to q sub i of t plus t naught, where t naught is some constant time. Um, if these satisfied the equations of motion, then we would find that these ones also satisfied the equations of motion. 
So we have three symmetries that we're talking about that we, that we found here. Translational, rotational, and time symmetries. All right. Now we're going to talk about symmetries of the Lagrangian. So in Lagrangian mechanics, we have, you know, our Lagrangian L that depends on all of the variables or all of the coordinates that we care about, Q sub i. And the Lagrangian will also depend on the velocities of all our coordinates. Um, here, I'm going to show that with a dot on top. So, I mean, this is just kind of long to write out. So sometimes you're going to see me just write this as L of Q sub i comma um, L of Q sub i dot. So we have a Lagrangian, and then if you remember, we also have our action S, which is just the integral from 2 times t1 and t2 of L dt. So, um, what is the symmetry of our Lagrangian? Well, say we had our paths, right, q sub i of t, and we were to somehow change them into different paths. Take these paths and make them into different paths. Um, q sub i prime of t. I'm going to say q sub i prime of t. Let's say L of q sub i of t and q sub i dot of t was equal to L of q sub i prime of t and q sub i prime dot of t. If we were to have this, then we would say that this transformation is a symmetry of our Lagrangian L. So why do we call this a symmetry? Well, um, we're changing, you know, we're changing the, we're changing our trajectories q sub i, and L is staying the same. Um, but uh, we call them symmetries of our Lagrangian because they really correspond to symmetries of our equation of motion. Let me show you how that is. Now, say we had a ball, right? And we threw it up in the air, and it were to go in this trajectory, right? It would start here at t1 and end here at t2. Um, and this path has some action, right? If we were to translate this path just over here, just to the right, in physical space, um, this path would also have some action, right? And the action of this path, the one on the right, is the same as the path on the left. So this represents a symmetry of our Lagrangian. Now, as you recall um, from the principle of least action and the Euler-Lagrange equation stuff, um, all nearby paths, all tiny variations to the path that the ball actually takes, um, don't change the action S to the first order in the variation, right? So I say these paths are stationary. Now the thing is that all paths have the same action when translated to the right. So not just the true path, but also all the same tiny variations. So actually, let me see if I can draw the exact same um, variation. So the exact same variation, once again, would look like that, right? So not only is the action of the, the true path, the green path, the same, but the action of all the tiny variations is the same. And so, the green path on the right is also stationary, because all the little um, tiny variations um, don't change to the first order in the variation, just like the ones on the left. Um, so therefore, symmetries of L give us 
symmetries of our equations of motion. So that's really why we even call these symmetries to begin with. Okay, so now we know about symmetries. And now I'm going to state Noether's theorem. So Noether's theorem says that for every continuous symmetry of our Lagrangian, we have a conserved quantity along trajectories that satisfy the equations of motion. And it turns out that if you have the symmetry of space translation, your conserved quantity is total momentum. When you have a symmetry of rotation, your conserved quantity is angular momentum. And when you have a symmetry of time translation, your conserved quantity is energy. And this last one is a little bit different from the other two. Um, so in the coming videos, I'm going to go through all of these three examples um, all independently. And I'm going to go through the same procedure for all three of them. And as we go through these procedures, we're going to learn something a little bit different about Noether's theorem, a new like, little aspect or insight. But I just want to say that these aren't the only three examples of Noether's theorem in real life. So this, I mean, these series of videos are only going to be about classical mechanics. But in quantum field theory, for example, you have other symmetries that give you conservation of charge and, you know, really cool stuff like that. And we're not going to talk about stuff like, you know, conservation of charge. Um, but there's so many examples of Noether's theorem besides these three. Um, but we're just going to start with these three. And something else, actually, I should mention before I go is continuous. What do I mean by a continuous symmetry? Well, a space translation, for example, you can translate something a little bit, and you can translate it a lot. Um, a rotation, for example, you could rotate something a little bit, or you could rotate it a lot in a smooth fashion. And it's the same thing for a time translation. An example of a symmetry that wouldn't be continuous is if you had a particle moving in some potential um, v of x, right, that was periodic. So here we can see that every you know, even spacing of V looks the same. So you would still have asymmetry of both your Lagrangian and your equation of motion. Namely, it's if you take a little trajectory in here and you translate it by a discrete amount, you get new, you, I mean, you get the same Lagrangian, you have a symmetry of your equation of motion. But because this isn't continuous, you can't only translate something a little bit. In this example, for example, um, momentum, you know, wouldn't be conserved. They wouldn't have this. So, yeah. Stay tuned.